What's the story, Morning Glory? What's the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of 90 Day Fiance Before the 90 Days, Cold and Calculated, Season 5, Episode 15. So, 90 Day Fiance, it is giving it to me just the way I like. It is so full of drama, so full of entertainment. I am loving it. Someone left a comment on one of my 90 Day Fiance videos saying something like, um, you have to be an intelligent person to realize that this isn't real and nobody cares. I care. I love the show. They're going to continue to get ratings from me. I don't know how they do the rating system. I don't know. I don't care. But I am a, a fan. I will continue to watch this show until the wheels fall off. I don't care if it's real. I don't care if it's scripted. I don't care if it's a little bit of both. I really don't care. Whatever it is, it's good TV. It's entertaining. Um, if they give these people scripts to read from, if they put them in unusual fake circumstances that they normally would not be in, I don't give a damn about any of that. I am enjoying the entertainment. I am loving 90 Day Fiance. So we're going to start off with Gino and Jasmine. We're back in Panama City in Jasmine's brand new apartment. So previously, Jasmine was living with a roommate. I guess she was having issues with her roommate. Um, surprise, surprise, she's having issues with someone else. And so her and Gino decided that it would be best for her to get her own place. So Gino said that he offered to pay for the apartment and he really wants her to be comfortable and happy until they go through the K-1 process. Gino was still not working, so he has to find a way to pay her rent, pay all of her expenses or the majority of them because she does work and she does have her own income. So I'm pretty sure she's going to be contributing to her own expenses, but he's going to be responsible for her rent and he also has to make sure that he's maintaining his own home in Michigan. So Gino was like really stressed out about this. So Jasmine says that um, she's not open to having a roommate. He suggested, what if you got a roommate to help alleviate some of the costs? And she was like, nope, I don't, I don't want a roommate. I want to live by myself. Jasmine says that she has faith in Gino, that he can keep up with her expenses and that she believes in him, that he will be able to financially support her. Um, you can do it, Gino. So Gino tells us that even though he's not working, he does have um, investments. He's got stocks. And I think he says it was like a total of $650,000 in stocks. But this is for his retirement. It's not for his everyday living. So he doesn't plan on using that money for his monthly cost or his monthly living expenses for himself and for Jasmine. So he's going to, I guess, he's going to have to figure it out. I'm pretty sure that when he goes back to Michigan, he'll be able to find a job. Now, um, when Jasmine husband had told him, you know, well, you need to go get a job when you go back home. You're going to have to get a job. He says something about, well, you know, with COVID, you know, things are really hard and blah, blah, blah. And she was like, no, I believe in you. You'll be able to find a job, you know, leave it up to Jasmine's just to stay on the positive side. So since they became engaged, Gino says that he's been very concerned about how Jasmine has been talking about their finances and their future. Um, it seems like, you know, I don't know if she's necessarily high maintenance or anything like that. Um, she doesn't come across as high maintenance. Like I said, he barely gives her anything and she's still happy with him. So yes, he's paying her rent and um, he's probably going to be paying for some of her expenses and giving her money when she needs it. But it's not like he's, she's expecting, you know, Louis Prada, Chanel bags, um, you know, all that extravagance, you know, she just wants her, her living expenses to be taken care of. And so when she, when he talks about, oh, I'm really worried about how she talks about finances, um, I'm not quite sure what he means by that because I, 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 does he not plan on being like a provider? Does he plan on things being more 50-50 between them? Um, she does talk about when she does move in with him into his Michigan home that she does want to redecorate. So he's stressing about that, you know, the cost of that. So, but you know, you're going to get a job. You're going to be fine. I'm pretty sure she doesn't mind working because she does work. So she's not like a complete gold digger where she does nothing while he's like completely taking care of her a thousand percent. So she does have her own job. She does have her own income. And I know when she comes to America, she's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be hard for her to find it. If Larissa, can find a job, Jasmine can find a job in the United States. So 
he needs to be a little bit, you know, less stressed out about that. So then the next thing that we see is that Gino is FaceTiming his uncle Marco back in Michigan. So he gets his uncle Marco up to speed with what's been going on. And he tells his uncle that he's never had a girl that loved him the way that she does. Now, when he said that, the first thing that popped into my mind was, is Jasmine really in love with Gino or is she just obsessed with him and obsessed with this relationship like she just is like um it's not so much Gino the person that she loves she just loves the fact that she's got this man that will do her bidding that she can control that allows her to be you know very dominant in their relationship you know um he's like her little puppy dog he wants to always please her he always wants to make her happy um whatever she says goes he doesn't really put up a fight too much so I'm beginning to like well I'm not beginning I've always wondered if this relationship is really because she's like in love with Gino or she's just in love with a man that she's able to control so um he also tells his uncle Marco that he proposed to Jasmine and that they're now engaged and he tells him about um her getting him getting her an apartment and as soon as he said that the look on uncle Marco's face completely just dropped he was like wow you got her an apartment okay so then uncle Marco very quickly brings up the prenup and um Gino says that he didn't have a prenup with his previous wife. So when they got a divorce, he had to pay her, I'm assuming, some type of a lump sum. And it really took a big chunk out of his savings. So he knows that he's going to have to have that prenup conversation with her. And he's scared to death of doing that because um, Jasmine is unpredictable and um very explosive. So he goes out to dinner with her and he plans that he's going to talk about the prenup during dinner. But um, Jasmine threw a curveball at him. So she sits down, they sit down, they're having dinner. And she says, you know, that she's looking back at, as she looks back at their relationship. And, you know, and she sees all the ups and downs. And she's like, you know, one day, I really love you, Gino. And then the next day, she says, I just want to cut you into pieces. And the way that she talks about murder, murdering him, you know, cutting him up into pieces. She does it like in this really cutesy way that only Jasmine can do it. Only Jasmine can make murder appear, you know, so cute. So Jasmine says that all of their problems stem from his exes. And she says that she's not happy because she looked online or something. And she realized that his ex-wife is still using Gino's last name. And she is not happy about that. And somehow she puts the blame on him as if, a last name is a tangible, uh, a tangible thing that you can actually give to someone. And then when they're supposedly done with it, you can get it back. And it's like, Jasmine, we know you're, you're crazy. And sometimes your crazy is entertaining, but right now the craziness that you are showing us about this whole last name thing, um, if it's real, then I'm beginning to kind of worry about your mental health because she says, how dare she still use your last name, Gino? Y'all are divorced. Y'all don't have any children together. Y'all have nothing to do with each other. So I'm going to need you to take your last name back. How do you take a last name back? This is her legal name. She obtained it, <laughs> obtained the name in, you know, a legal way, a legal manner, uh, it's an option for the wife to still, to to still use her husband's last name, or she can also include a name change in her divorce if she wants to go back to her maiden name or use a different name. So, um, it's her right to keep the name. It is her name legally and she chose not to change it. So Jasmine, um, we're going to need you to focus on something else. Um, if you want to obsess on something, please obsess on giving your man more confidence and walking around without a hat and trying to fake the funk with the fringe in the back of his head, making people think, or he thinks he's making people think that he has a full head of hair because he's got fringe in the back of his neck. So maybe you should need to like focus on that or maybe focus on on um, mental health, you know, focus on being a healthier you. Uh, Maybe also focus on um, trying to figure out why your soon to be husband was sending half naked pictures of you to his ex-wife and getting down to the bottom of that. Maybe you need to be focused on that. Don't get so worked up on what some woman decides to keep as her last name. 
Um, like you said, Jasmine, they have nothing to do with each other. Um, it's just a name. It's just a name. Um, I don't know how unique his last name is, but it could possibly be the kind of name that a lot of people have. So for her to act like this is his property and that he can like either go to court and file an action to stop her from using this name, it's ridiculous. And Jasmine, I mean, excuse me, Gina, for you to even entertain this conversation, um, I kind of worry about you as well. This is not even a conversation worth having. I'm pretty sure that you would have um, distracted her from the whole name discussion if you would have brought up the prenup. So Jasmine tells him that, you know, she expects him to do something about the ex-wife using his last name. And Gino is like, yes, I will definitely look into that. I will have to, you know, look at the law and see what the law says. Well, let me save you the trouble, Gino. The law says she can call herself whatever the hell she wants. She can call herself Bugs Bunny if she wants to. If she wants to keep that married name that she got, legally through marrying you uh she can do that so there's nothing to look up moving on to Jimena and Mike so Mike is still wandering around aimlessly um in the night trying to get himself together and um Jimena says that she cannot see herself living a happy life with him. I think the producers are asking her questions while, you know, Mike is off in the darkness. And she says that she cannot, she cannot really see herself like living this happy everyday life with Mike. And she understands what marrying him could mean for her and her children. But when it comes to like the real deal, holy field, daily living of marriage, she just couldn't see herself being happy with him. So I'm a little bit more like team Jimena than I am team Mike, because I feel like Jimena was only doing what Mike allowed her to do and Mike allowed her to do a lot. And not only should Mike have known himself that he was probably doing too much for someone who was not giving the same energy back to him, but so many people had told him, people that he cares about, people that care and love him, that want the best for him. They had told him over and over again, please be careful with this woman. Stop sending her money. Stop taking care of her financially. And he refused to listen, absolutely refused to listen. So he's grown. There's nothing wrong with him mentally. Um, He's a big boy. He should have known what the what's up was, but he chose to ignore it. He chose to hold on to this stupid faith and hope that things were going to work out between them. And now he's gotten, gotten himself in a real pickle. So Jimena says that she's not willing to sacrifice her happiness just to be financially supported. And that's another thing. Jimena had told him you know, I don't need your money. If you think this is about money, it's not about that because you can keep your money. You don't have to pay my rent. You don't have to do anything because I was taking care of myself before I met you. I will take care of myself after you're gone. So whatever you want back, get it back, keep your money. I don't need it. So I don't know how much of a gold digger she possibly can be if someone is offering you to support you and to give you things. Now, some people might say, well, just because it's being offered to you doesn't mean that you should take it because it's like you're taking advantage of the person. But if the person person is a grown adult making an independent decision to do something. Of course, you know, I can see that some people might be like, well, the moral thing for her to have done if she wasn't interested in him, especially since she knew that he was in love with her. He wanted to have a future with her. He wanted to marry her. And for her to accept things from him, it's almost as if she was leading him on. Like, um, I know he loves me and he's offering me all this, all this stuff, all these material things, paying my rent, and I'm still going to take it knowing that I don't want to be with him, but knowing that he does want to be with me. Even if it's like that, okay, you can say, okay, maybe her moral compass is a little bit off. I still f feel like Mike should have known better. He just should have known better. Um, sometimes you just have to understand, like, and I, I, I don't know how to say this without sounding um, rude, okay? But not to say that Jimena is like the most beautiful girl in the world, okay? I'm not saying that at all. Um, if anything, you know, her looks are probably um, average or slightly above average. I don't know. Um, you know, she's a cute girl. And I'm not saying that Mike should feel like he could only be with, you know, a wildebeest. Like he's only good enough for a wildebeest. All I'm saying is that 
the lifestyle that he lived and the lifestyle that she was living and the kind of girl that she is, she's like somewhat of like a wild girl, you know, um, not wild in a bad way, but I just don't see how their lifestyles would have matched. For example, she likes to go out, she likes to drink and go to the bars and hang out all night. And Mike has to get up in the morning and go to work. That's just not his lifestyle. So I just feel like there were signs letting him know that this girl just really wasn't the one for him. And then as soon as um, he landed in Colombia, okay, even if he was supporting her up until the point he arrived in Colombia that first time, okay, fine. But then once he landed in Colombia that very first time and she started talking about his hygiene and saying some really, you know, awful things to him, that would, would have been enough, I feel like, for the average person to say, I can't be with you if you can say such things to me. You know, there were always signs, there were always flags, there was always like these warning signs letting him know that um, maybe you don't want this relationship with the girl like this. You know, she's very insulting and he could have picked up the hint and just ended it, but he didn't. He kept on overlooking it. You know, she told him you pass gas too much, so he decided not to pass gas anymore. You burp too much, so he decided not to burp anymore. Um, those are the kind of things that she would tell him and he just took it and was like, okay, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. When I think the normal average person would have been like, how dare you? Uh, no, we're not going to be doing this and would have broken up with her, but I digress. So Mike is, he comes back, he finally comes back to the table to talk to her and he questions where it all went wrong. And he said, he said that he thought this was real for him. Um, it was like a real relationship and you question where it went wrong. It went wrong, Mike, when she told you that you were disgusting, that you were nasty, that, you know, you disgusted her. You're not clean. You toot too much. You burped. I mean, that's where it went. Were you not there when she was saying these things to you? Where were you? And so, um, um, Jimena tells him that she loves him, but she's not in love with him. She then tells him that she wants him out of her house. And that's another thing. Okay, the first time she insulted you, you still came back. The second time she was really cold, really distant. You even said it yourself on how different she is and you still stayed. So the second time around, she kind of told you bluntly that she just wasn't that interested in you and you still overlooked it and you still wanted to stay. If someone keeps telling you the stove is hot, the stove is hot, don't touch it. Don't you see that, you know, it's glaring red, it's hot, don't touch it. And you still put your hand on it. How am I supposed to feel sorry for you? Anyways, so, so she tells him that she wants him out of her, her house and, um, I, that, I kind of questioned that I was like, Kimena, that's not your house. Maybe legally it is. Maybe she's the one that is on the documents as the renter, uh, or the lessee, the lessee of that particular apartment or house. Maybe it is legally hers, but I mean, if he's paying the rent there, why wouldn't he be able to stay there? So, um, he begs to stay in the house. Like once again, he's begging her and I'm like, Mike, do you not know how this is looking? You're 30 something years old. Do you have any idea what life is all about? <laughs> like, how can you sit there? First of all, you beg to sleep with her, which was embarrassing enough. Now she's kicking you out of her house and you're begging her to stay there. You're begging her for you to stay there. So then they ride back. So I think she went ahead and said yes. I think she relented. I don't know. But they end up driving back to the home. And it was like, a, I can only imagine how uncomfortable that ride was. So once again, Mike has an opportunity to save face and to go to a hotel and then fly back home. Because I think she offered him that she would pay for his hotel. That's how badly she wanted this man out of her house. I think she even offered to pay for his hotel for the night. And, um, he was like, no, I'm not gonna, I don't, I'm not gonna do that. Let her pay for the hotel. At least let her do something for you for once. And the next day go home. But he said, no. So, Whatever he's lost in this relationship, whatever he's lost financially, as far as time and energy, um, he should just take it as a very expensive lesson and cut his losses and stop the hemorrhaging, stop the bleeding. 
So anyway, they arrive at the house, her sister's there, and um, he sits down on the couch and he's looking really sad. And the sister asks him what's wrong. And he doesn't want to talk about it. He says he just wants to go to bed. So Jimena comes down or Jimena sits with her sister and Jimena tells her sister what's been happening. And, you know, they're talking about it. And Mike is upstairs, I guess, in the little boy's room. And um, Jimena says that she's better off being alone than dealing with Mike. The sister says, but um, you won't, we won't have as much as we did before. Now, that was, you know, um, a statement that could make people dislike Jimena and her family because it's like, okay, just put up with it because if you break up with him, we're not going to have as much as we did before, you know, as if Mike is supporting Jimena and possibly her family as well. If he is, he's doing it willingly. He's doing it voluntarily. No one's putting a gun to his head to do that. He's choosing to do that. And in a lot of places around the world, when you have that opportunity for someone to, I guess, you know, take care of you or give you money, most people, in this world would take it because for a lot of people, everyday living is hard. Um, there is no such thing. I'm not saying this specifically about Colombia because I don't know what it's like in Colombia, but I know that in a lot of countries, if you don't work and you don't have your own money, you are destitute and there is no public assistance. There is no welfare. There is no Medicaid. There is none of that. So, um, they have an opportunity for someone to who's offering, hey, I want to give you money. I want to take care of y'all. They'd be stupid not to not to take them up on that offer, especially when they were not living in the lap of luxury before Mike. So I can understand the sister saying that. And I can understand also how some people could look at that and be like, oh, they're just users. You know, they just want to use this man because Mike does have this intention of wanting to marry him and, uh, and spend his life with her. And that's the reason why he's doing all of this, you know, because he, he sees a future with her. He's not doing it just to do it. He's doing it because he wants to take care of his future wife and his future in-laws. And they're like taking advantage of that, you know, because they're like, well, we don't know if Jimena's going to stay with him and Jimena's like, well, I know I don't want to be with him. But as soon as she made up that, that when she, as soon as she made that decision in her mind that she wasn't going to be with him, she told him, stop with the money, just stop. But the point is that like the sister now is saying, if you don't stay with him, we're not going to have as much as we did before. So Jimena says, um, we'll have food and we'll have a roof over our head. And that's all we need. We don't need any of the extras. We don't need the 65 inch, uh, television screens. We don't need the expensive furniture. We don't need all of that. We have a roof over our head and we'll have food and we'll be fine. So he comes down and he wants to get her attention and he accidentally calls her a more. And then he corrects himself and he calls her by her name, Jimena. So he says that a small part of him believes that it's not over because she told him that he could stay there until his flight the next day. So Mike, stop twisting reality. She wasn't like, hey, Mike, I know you want to go to a hotel, but I really want you to stay here with me until you leave. It wasn't like that. She told you, get the hell out of my house. You begged her to stay. And so she relented. So it's not like, oh, she still wants me to be around. So I still have hope in this. You begged her to stay after she kicked you out. So then she comes down and she's got the, the wedding rings and she gives it back to him. And she says, we're not going to get married so you can have your rings back, which is a good thing because anybody else probably would have kept them and sold them. But she went ahead and she gave him back the wedding rings and he acts really confused. And he's like, um, no, um, I want you to keep them until we can work out our differences. What? Mike? What happened? I mean, is this like invasion of the body snatchers? Is someone like stealing, like is someone like kidnapping you? Like are aliens kidnapping you, um, taking you into, into outer space and then bringing you back and you cut completely missed a big chunk of what was going on. And they sent in like a copycat of you when she was kicking you out and telling you she didn't want to be with you and telling you that she doesn't love you. And, where were you? When all, what do you mean until we can work out our differences? Like, where were you when she told you, I don't want to be with you. I don't, I'm not in love with you. I don't want to marry you. I didn't want any of this stuff. And you can take all your crap back. What do you mean work at? This is what I'm talking about. He chooses to see what he wants to see. And then he blames her when she doesn't respond accordingly, especially after she has told him multiple times, I don't want to be with you. Go away. Get the hell away from me now. 
And still you're going to say, oh, no, keep the rings, baby, because we can work out our differences. (sighs) And so Jimenez says, our relationship is over. I don't want them. And Mike says that you're losing the, now he's getting upset because she's not even willing to keep, you know, the, the, the rings, which, you know, she could have kept. And like I said, sold them or whatever. Um, she's not, she's not even willing to do any of that. And maybe she doesn't have that mindset to do that, but she's not even to do, you know, willing to do any of that. So Mike says, you're losing the best thing that you could have had. And then he met a, uh, she comes back with the quickness and says, the best thing that I have are my children and nothing else matters to me. And then Mike says, he, he tries to lay down the guilt trip on him, on her really thick. And he tells her something about, you know, well, you do understand that I've kept you and your children off the streets. So you met her on the streets, Mike, or did you meet her on these internet streets? And we'll get to that right now. So Jimena says that she would have been just fine without his help. Jimena in her confessional says that she never asked him for anything. He gave everything to her willingly and voluntarily. She not once ever begged him for money, asked him for money, none of that. And I don't think I've ever heard Mike even say, um, she was always using me for, she was always begging me for money. She was always um, asking me for money. The only time that I've seen her ask him for anything was when she wanted money for her plastic surgery. So Mike says, what kind of uh, modeling are you going to do? Because she tells him, you know, I can take care of myself. I can do modeling. I can go back to modeling. And then he tells her, what kind of modeling are you going to do? Are you going to go back to the adult internet job? And I thought to myself, Mike, you are really digging a deeper hole for yourself. Like, how dare you? That is so not cool. That is so not cool. So before I, I get deeper into that, Jimena says, well, what's wrong with that? And then Jimena, supposedly Jimena tells us that supposedly her and Mike had met on the adult websites. And she said that, um, he was on that website like every day, I guess, you know, uh, either for other women or specifically for her, but he was on that, on that internet website, that adult website every day. And that's how they met. And he's ashamed that he met her in that forum or in that way. So he doesn't like to tell people, he doesn't want it exposed that that's how he met because it says more about him than it does about her. So for him to throw that back in her face as if he had nothing to do with that, it was such a low blow. It was so disrespectful and it was just so ugly and nasty. And she had tried to be very diplomatic with you in the beginning, you know, trying to let you down easily. Um, she would even cry when she was telling him that she didn't want to be with him and she didn't think this was going to work out. She would even start crying. And then for you to come back with, so what are you going to do? You're going to go back to your adult website you want to expose her. You want to out her for what she was doing for a living. Don't act like it's a problem now when it wasn't a problem then, when you were ogling her naked body, uh, paying her money to see her naked body because for whatever reason, you couldn't get a real life girl to look at in your own home or your own room. So you're on the internet paying women to do whatever, uh, to get your rocks off. And now you're going to throw that back in her face. Well, these women wouldn't have to do that if there wasn't men to pay for that because you can get it for free from your own girlfriend. Oh yeah, but you don't have one. You have to go find one on the internet, but let's move on from that. So, um, he offers her, he lets her know that, you know what, if you stay with me, basically, you know, come back to New York with me, uh, I, you'll have so much more opportunities in the United States than you would here. She said that she never wanted to go to New York. She said she's happy in Colombia. And Mike says, why are you being like this? You just don't care. And Jimena says, I've told you a thousand different ways that it's over. So leave and get a hotel. Mike refuses because he says, I pay rent here, so I'm not going anywhere. But why do you want to stand in an uncomfortable, hostile situation? Like, why do you want to do that, Mike? Stop paying the rent, pack your bags and go home. So Jimena says that um, she's done with him. She's tired of him criticizing her and throwing her past back in her face. I thought that was just really ugly of him to do that because you just exposed yourself because you, you, you think you're exposing her and she turned around and exposed you. It's not just her working on those adult websites. It's you paying money to participate on those adult websites. So he runs back up, back up into the room. And then this is when, you know, he calls her out of her name and he says, you know, nothing matters to her other than the money. She's a mean, evil, cold hearted B I T. Mm-hmm. And, um, 
you know, he just really is upset. And, and, and I totally understand that he's hurt and he feels like he was taken for a ride and he was made a fool out of. But Mike, like I said, there were warning signs. I, it wasn't like this girl was like always, oh my God, I love you. I'm in love with you. I want to be with you. And then she marries you and does all of this. And then all of a sudden, you know, she just breaks your heart. She told you so many times that she didn't want to be with you. Anyways, moving on. So Mike says that he wants to stand up for himself. So this is when he chooses uses that time to stand up for himself. So he comes back downstairs where she's at. And I think she was outside talking to her sister. And so he tells Jimena that he wanted to stay this last night. So now he's going to try to once again, guilt her into letting him stay. So he tells her, can I just stay this one night so that I can say goodbye to the kids in the morning? Mike, don't you dare use her children to get what you want out of this. Don't you dare bring the kids into this. That's awful. So you're going to have to guilt her. Oh, I need to say goodbye to your children. Uh, why don't you just leave the hotel a little bit earlier, stop by and say goodbye. You don't have to stay the night to say goodnight to the kids. I mean, to say goodbye to the kids before you come back to the United States. So she says, no, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to let you stay for you to say goodbye to my kids. No, that's not going to happen. So then he refuses to leave. So he runs back up to the room and he goes up there because she's upset now because she really wants him to go. Her sister follows them just in case, you know, they start, you know, throwing blows. The sister goes up there to referee and he says in Spanish, this is stupid. He misinterprets what she said. And he thought that she said, you're stupid. So then he says, you're stupid. And then she's like, you're calling me stupid for her. It didn't make any sense because she never called him stupid. She just said this whole situation is stupid. And so when he called her stupid, she got really offended by that. She was like, you're calling me stupid. And so she runs and her mom was downstairs and she runs into her mother's arms arms and she's no first um her son she goes and she sits on the stairs or something and her son comes to her her oldest son comes to her and her oldest son uh, you know he hugs her and he comforts her because he sees that his mom is in distress and it was really really sad because it didn't even have to be like this it didn't even have to go this far now the child is stressed out not knowing what's going on you got the kids involved in this craziness and so then she goes downstairs and she runs into her mother's arms and she tells her mother he's just so rude because he called her stupid so the sister tries to explain to Mike, you misunderstood what she said. She wasn't calling you stupid. She was calling the situation stupid. But then you turned around and you insulted her. And so Mike feels really bad about it. And he asks the sister if he can come back the next day to say goodbye to everyone. The sister, you know, being as nice as she, she is, she was like, yes, it's fine if you come back the next day. And that's where that scene ended. Mike, you could have just, like I said, do you, do you, do you know what pride is or self-respect? self-respect do these words sound familiar to you at all it's like even though your heart wants to stay your heart wants Jimena your heart your heart wants this to work out so bad your heart wants to cry and beg and plead for her to stay with you we get it because honey we've all been there but you have to let your mind control the situation and you always have to ask yourself how does this look? How, how am I looking right now? How is this coming across? I don't know. Maybe he, he doesn't have that. That part of his brain doesn't work. I don't know. Moving on to Memphis and Hamza. It's the day of the wedding. They're getting ready. She's getting ready for her wedding day. And someone is like fixing her hair. And uh, her future mother-in-law is like stuffing lamb liver down her throat. And, you know, she doesn't really like it. But she keeps on shoving lamb liver in her mouth. Um, and then Hamza comes into the room. And Hamza talks about how normally the bride and groom would get ready in separate houses. But um, because, you know, she's the one visiting him and doesn't have her own house, they're going to be getting ready together in the same house. Now, all I have to say about this is when he came into the room and he I was like Hamza needs to consider modeling when he comes to the United States if he can't get a job nowhere else he needs to really consider modeling he's a when he cleans up he cleans up really well and he was looking really good and so he should consider that he should seriously consider that so um, in his confessional, Hamza says that he's very happy. His family is very happy for them. Um, even his father attended the wedding. Even his father showed up. And Hamza was excited to show his dad that he's a man now and he's ready to take on the responsibilities of a wife and being a husband. So it meant uh, so much to him for his father to be there. Memphis says in her confessional that Hamza looks so regal in his, um, in his groom's uh, 
outfit. He does. He looks, he looked really, really good. And she looked really pretty as well. And so Memphis says that she doesn't trust him, but she's not sure. She says that she does trust him, but she's not sure if he can really trust anyone. Okay, Memphis, we're bored talking about your prenup, postnup nonsense. So Hamza says um, that um, Hamza, she, Memphis says that Hamza gives her a sense of family that she never felt before. And I like it when she talks like that, when she says those kind of things, because it just makes her seem so much more a relatable human. And it's just wonderful to see like how much these two people really mean to each other. And it's just beautiful. I love it. When they're not talking about prenup and postnups, it's, I love looking, watching their relationship grow. So they enter the wedding venue and, um, Memphis says that it feels like she's been rewarded for all that she's been through as a child, as in, you know, being in the foster care system and going from home to home. Now she's going to have a husband, she's going to have in-laws and his family has accepted her and welcomed her with open arms. And so she says that she feels like, you know, this is family to her, something that she never really had as a child. And so it just means a lot to her. And I love it when she talks like this. So they take, they get married um, and then it's time to celebrate and they celebrate. And she tells us that the next day they're going to start their honeymoon so I guess it was the next day because I think they're in a hotel the next time that we see them they're in a hotel it's morning he comes in with breakfast coffee and some type of pastry and she sits down on the bed next to him and she says that she doesn't really feel well and he's like oh what's wrong baby and so she's like I'm pregnant and I was like say what now excuse me now, I heard some rumblings on the internet that, you know, Memphis was pregnant, but, you know, I take it for a grain of salt and I don't want to dig too deep into the internet stuff because I don't want, I don't want, I don't want any spoilers for the show. So I want to watch the show as it happens, you know, naturally for us. I don't want to go and look ahead and see, are they still together? Da, da, da. I don't want to see any of that. So, but I did hear some rumblings going around that she possibly was pregnant, but I didn't take it too seriously. And I thought it probably happened way after they stopped recording, but it's like right here, uh, episode 15, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. She is preggers. And I was just like, Lord have mercy. How long? The first thing that came into my mind was Memphis. How long have you been in Tunisia? Because it seems like you've been there like a couple of weeks, but evidently she's been there about three weeks and then she must've landed. She must've been ovulating as soon as she landed that those eggs were ripe and ready to go. And, um, she must have gotten pregnant that very first night because she said that she's been that she's about three weeks pregnant and I'm assuming she's been there about three weeks I was blown away you could have knocked me over with a feather when she said that and then she went and she got the pregnancy test and she showed it to him and I was surprised on how dark the test line was compared to the control line because if you're three weeks pregnant I'm thinking that the test line would still be kind of faint noticeable but faint but that test line was super, super dark. It's what they call like a dye stealer. The test line is so dark that it's actually stealing dye from the control line, which means that her pregnancy hormones are really strong. I could be wrong in all of this, but that's what I've, that's what I've gathered, you know, from just, you know, living life. So I was like, damn, that test line is dark. She is really pregnant. Yeah. She says she's pregnant and he is so happy. I was happy that he was happy. Um, Memphis tells us that she really wasn't planning on having another child. And I'm like, okay, how do you not, if you're not preventing, as far as I'm concerned, you're definitely planning, especially, you know, you know how kids are made because you have two of them. So if you're not preventing, you are basically planning. So she talks about how, you know, it's just really wasn't like in her future to like have another child like this, but she's happy because she wanted to give him a child. And so, you know, she's happy. She is a little bit stressed out knowing that she's going to be doing this primarily on her own until he's able to come to the United States to join her. And I'm just so happy that Hamza is happy. Then I was getting worried about what his family would think. So they go home and then he tells his mom and his sister that she's pregnant. Pregnant. And they were also happy. And I was like, this is like a win, 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 win situation all the way around. Everybody's happy about this. And I just love Hamza's family because coming in the United, you know, living in the United States, 
living in this the, the society that we live in where race is such a big deal and everything is so divided by race um it's beautiful to look at another culture not even give it a second thought the fact that you know they're tunisian she's african american it was never brought up it was never mentioned it was just a beautiful thing to see that they just accepted her a hundred percent wholeheartedly the only issue the mother had was the you know premarital premarital relations but she got over that quickly and then when they announced that she was pregnant you know the mom was a little bit concerned but then after that she was happy for them and the sister was happy for them and it's just other than you know her craziness about you know my money my my money mom other than that she is this hamza and memphis story is a beautiful story <laughs> It's a really beautiful story when you really think about it. So, um, yeah, that's that's about all I can say about, about that. Congratulations to Memphis and Hamza. Congratulations a hundred times over. I am so happy for them. I'm so happy for Hamza because I, he did say something like, you know, for so long he's been alone. He felt like he was alone. But now he has a wife and he's expecting a child and he's so excited about it. And it's just a beautiful thing. Let's hope they keep that momentum going. Moving on to Ben and Mahogany. So Ben is back in San Bartolo, San, Bar San Bartolo and he hasn't heard from Mahogany. And so he still feels hopeful that they can still work things out. He reaches out to her and tells her that he wants to meet her at the spot where they first met, which was like on that pier thing. And so um, he wants to apologize about how he acted, so on and so forth. So uh, Mahogany says that she left uh, Hua Kachina because Ben was being disrespectful to her and to her parents for not showing up for breakfast and not even texting her, letting her know that he wasn't going to show up. So they were sitting there like idiots waiting for him. And she said that she'll give him a chance to explain himself. And so they do meet up and he gives, he apologizes. He profusely apologizes. He gives her a teddy bear and he apologizes for the restaurant as well because uh, Mahogany says that when she came to give him the note from her dad, that her dad wouldn't be able to meet him. She thought that that would have been like, a way for them to smooth things over but it wasn't he was still upset so he apologized for that and um she says that it seemed like he didn't care whether she stayed or not so that's why she had no problem leaving because you know I guess she was kind of thinking that he was being really rude to her and so that's why she took off and left him there so Mahogany forgives him and um she's like I forgive you we can put the past behind us you just better not do that again so he promises to never do that again I guess that being being rude and disrespectful so she gives him a second chance and um, she wants to see if they can reconnect again and if they can make it like the way it was when they were chatting online because she fell in love with that Ben, the online Ben, because her conversations were so deep. And now that she saw him in person, it's like it wasn't the same person. So she talks about how they have a lot in common as far as religion and family. So she does want to see if this could work out. So Ben says, you know, my truth is, is that I still love you and I always will. And Mahogany says, you know, this is also confusing. And when she said confusing, he said, um, he misunderstood what she said. But anyways, she's like, you know, this is also confusing. And I'm sorry, I'm thinking I'm going to sneeze. And it was at that moment that, um, they just ended up kissing out of nowhere. And so they kissed and I guess it was electrifying for both of them. Um, electrifying enough that, uh, she's gonna, she wants to see him the next day, which is going to be his last full day in San Bartolo. So the way that they were going at it, I was like, okay, is this Mr. I'm abstaining until marriage because it seemed like, and she ended up pushing him away because I guess it was getting too much. She ended up actually pushing him away. And I was thinking to myself, if she didn't push him away and if she let this go on, would he have been able to keep the promise to himself that he was going to abstain until marriage? So they plan to see each other the next day. Ben says in his confessional that he's never kissed anyone like that and that it was mind blowing. So the next day they meet at, um, they meet at a park. Oh, Miguel Grau park and um I was really like looking forward to this I was like okay she's giving him a second chance she kissed him things are gonna probably 
work out until he started talking about, well, I need to get to the bottom of her not being transparent. I need to get to the bottom of all of her discrepancies, you know, her picture, her age, her apartment. I need to get to the bottom of all of this. And I'm like, Ben, why do you need to get to the bottom of all of this? Can't we just start fresh? She lied about her age. She was off by a year, not even like 10 years. Can we get off of the age thing? Eventually, as y'all get closer, y'all will be able to, you, you know, you'll find out everything that you'll, you'll find out everything that you want to know about her. Just give it time. Don't just like start off with, well, I want to know why you lied about this and why you lied about that and why you lied about that. Don't start it, start off like that. Don't start off your second chance like that. But that's exactly what he does because he's stupid. So they sit down at a bench and he starts off the conversation with, why are your pictures different? Why do you look different from your pictures and your age? Why did you lie to me about your age? Mahogany was like, uh, I don't remember lying to you about my age. And he's like, yes, you did. And I have the text message to prove it that you lied to me about your age. You said you were 23, but you're actually 22. And I have the proof. What do you, how do you think you're going to start a romantic relationship with her when you start off by accusing her like this? Like, what is wrong with you? So, um, He's asking her, why are you hiding your age? And she says, I don't understand what you mean. He says, are you hiding your age because of our age gap? Ben, your age gap is the size of the Grand Canyon. She lied about one year, okay, which is like an inch compared to this Grand Canyon of an age gap. So it's not a big deal. It's, she was a year off. It wasn't like she was 20 years off or 10 years off. It was just a year off. Maybe she forgot how old she was. I mean... That's been known to happen. So um, she's like, no, I wasn't trying to hide my age. And then she's like, wait a minute. If you're going to be attacking me for me, like lying about my age and all this other stuff, what about you? Your lives are much deeper and they're even more concerning because you lied about how things went down with your exes and your ex-wife and whatever else. So what about that? And she's like, and, she, and then she says, this is crazy. She says, Ben, is still so she says this is crazy and he still wants to get deeper he still wants to talk more about her discrepancies and then she's like you know what mm -mm, i ain't got time for this i am not the one she puts on her coat and she is out of there she is gone mahogany has left the building good job ben on your second chance that you never would have gotten otherwise moving on to usman and kimberly so it is time for usman i'm sorry it is time for kimberly to get ready to leave usman's gonna stay in tanzania another day to take care of business but um kimberly's going back to the united states so you know she's really sad about him leaving about her leaving and she says that you know she truly loves usman from the bottom of her heart and that the song he made for her made her very optimistic for their future Really? That one song did it for you, Kimberly? Your expectations are subpar. So in the car, on their way to the airport, she starts crying. You know, she's like, oh, um, you know, she's just crying about leaving. And then he tries to comfort her. You know, he's trying to like find a way to hold her and comfort her. But it's like really awkward. I don't know why he was having, he was struggling because like one minute he's got his hand on her boob and then like he's fumbling around with her boob. And then the next minute he's like molesting her stomach. And it's like, what are you trying to do? Like, why can't you hold this woman? So in her confessional, she says that he makes her feel loved and he's very attentive to her. How? At, maybe someone snatched my body and I completely missed that. When was he attentive to her? She's always been extremely attentive to him. But anyways, so she says that she hasn't felt that in a long time and that she de deserves it. And evidently she got more yummy the night before. And so uh, she makes him promise not to be with anybody else. Don't give your yammy away to anybody else. And he says that he's not even thinking about that. That doesn't, hasn't even crossed his mind to do anything like that. So she's worried that she's worried if their relationship can sustain the long distance because, you know, long distance relationships are very hard to maintain. Um, so she worries about that. She thinks that the dynamic of the relationship is going to change if she's not all up in his face all the time, you know, controlling him. She she wonders how, where is this relationship, relationship going to even go? So they're at the airport and um, the producers ask, 
are y'all going to kiss? Are you going to give her a kiss goodbye? And he said no, because he says there's like an issue with public display of affection for him. I don't know if it's a cultural thing or an Usman thing, or I'm just not that into her thing. So I don't want nobody to think that this is my woman. I don't know. So, but he refuses to give her a kiss goodbye. And that really affected her. And then when they were saying goodbye in their airport, you know, they're hugging each other. And she said, I love you to him two different times and he didn't say it back to her. Kimberly says in her confessional that you have to be so secure to be in a long distance relationship, but he makes her feel insecure. Red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. Okay, we'll see how that works out. Um, so that is the end of my review. It went on way longer than I expected, but I had a whole lot to say. If you made it this long, 50 minutes in, I really do appreciate it. Um, it means so much to me, even if you make it through halfway or even if you make it through for one minute, it means a lot to me that you would choose to spend your time with me. Please don't forget to rate the video and please, by all means, do not forget to subscribe. And I will definitely talk to you later.